Recently, the fitness space has heard a lot about heart rate training and specifically about like zone two cardio and certainly like this like lower intensity steady state cyclical training has its place mainly developing just like the, the average person's uh, aerobic system to a let's call it competent level which is going to have a profound impact on things like health markers on cognitive functioning and truthfully i don't care about that a whole lot uh, in the words of kelly starrett i care about the dirty nasty performance in other words helping athletes achieve their physical performance potential. So today let's talk about more than zone two cardio. Let's talk about all things heart rate training. The fitness movement is brought to you by Zor Fitness. We offer coaching and individualized program design as well as educational content for coaches and athletes. It's all at one place. It's warfitness.com. Today, I want to go over six different principles of heart rate training. Uh, however, before we get into those, I think it would be inappropriate if we didn't at least go over what heart rate zones are and like the basic idea of them and what the most common ones are. We actually just adopted our uh, heart rate model for uh, Zor Fitness to reflect what has become uh, probably the most popular model, which is a five zone model. Now, uh, zones one through five are kind of ramping up and matching and mirroring, uh, someone's max heart rate as a result. So zone one in our model, and as well as like, you're going to see this for, you know, Garmin, um, whoop, other companies like that. Uh, zone one is 50 to 60% of one's max heart rate. So to make this a little bit more practical, I'm going to go over, uh, my max heart rate, which based on the couple different calculators that I use, not that are just kind of randomly out there, but are based on research. And it's actually average several different research studies, the, the calculations that they've used. And we'll actually go over those a little bit today. But anyway, just for uh, the conversation here, I'm gonna be using my 29 year old self currently to, to kind of generate this max heart rate, which would be 188, um, which is actually fairly accurate to what mine is. I think mine's probably a little bit closer to 185, but 185 to 188, in this case 188, will be fine for our purposes today. Zone one, 50 to 60% of one's max heart rate. So in this case, for me, it would be between 94 and 113 beats per minute. Zone two would be from 60 to 70%. So for me, 113 to 132 beats per minute. Zone three, 70 to 80% max heart rate, 132 to 151. Zone four, 80 to 90%, 151 to 170. And then finally, zone five, 90 to 100% of one's max heart rate from 170 to 188 for me in this case. So as you're actually writing training, you can either use those zones that I just mentioned, like that, that five zone model to prescribe training, you could use it as percent of someone's max heart rate, or you could actually write it as beats per minute. There's going to be benefits and drawbacks to each one of those. Let's think about the zones. <laughs> if you're using a five zone model, that means that there's pretty big bands, right? In other words, there's 10% range for each of those from, you know, 151 to 170 for me. Zone four is a pretty big range, right? There's a big difference between me feeling like I'm at 151 on an air bike and me being at 170. It's a pretty big range. So you can only get so nuanced and granular with how you go about writing heart rate training if you're using a, a zone model only. Personally, I like using zones quite a bit, but then also I will stray from them when I need to get more specific with a particular athlete or a particular protocol. So I think that the benefit to zone is that they're pretty simple and that you can, again, give an athlete a little bit of a range often is appropriate to still have some, some individual variability actually built into that is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, however, if you do want to get more specific, something like using a percent of max heart rate would be a really good option because you can get as specific as you want. You could write, you know, 75% of their some max heart rate, or you could write 77% of their max heart rate. You can get very down to, you know, as detailed as you would want to go. The other cool thing about using a, someone's percent of their max heart rate is that you could write a, a program for a number of people where it's going to be tailored to each one of those. So in other words, max heart rate is not individualized. Whereas if you're writing it in beats per minute, it would be. 
it'd be very similar to like percentage work for weightlifting, right? If you write back squats at 80%, that could be appropriate for a whole number of people doing the program versus if you said back squats at 315 pounds, for example. So you need to be careful if you're giving beats per minute because you have to know exactly who that athlete is. For that same reason, that's why I really like doing that oftentimes for athletes because if I have a specific athlete that I'm writing for, I know what their max heart rate is. I know that they have whatever wearables that can actually measure heart rate. It allows me to be very specific and there's no interpretation for the athlete. They're not having to calculate anything out. It's very simple, very straightforward. And it's also like what they're actually going to be seeing when they actually go to do their training. Like you can probably set up a watch to do like you know, present your heart rate as a percent of your max. However, most of the time you're seeing it as beats per minute. So it makes sense for an athlete to, you know, have their training dictated in the way where that's actually the case where it's written in beats per minute. That would probably be ideal, but that's for an individual. I've written an article on this topic. It was called using heart rate monitors for training CrossFit athletes. I will link to that in the show notes. So people are curious as always, the show notes will be at zorfitness.com slash podcast slash in this case, zero nine eight. One more thing before we get into the principles is that oftentimes athletes who don't have heart rate monitors available to them, or they don't have it for all of their training, where it doesn't necessarily work on all of their training. Like, you know, if they're doing burpees and, and row cows, it might not work where their device can actually give them accurate data, which is often the case. And often what this means is that we have to switch to more of a, a language and using, um, effort and things like that to kind of paint a picture of where that could land for heart rate zones. So zone one, I'll often say that's like an easy pace, conversational pace, um, warm up pace would all be examples there. Zone two, I typically say smooth pace. Zone three, moderate. Sometimes I'll say cruise. Zone four would be tough pace. You could say um, like aerobic power. You could say max repeatable pace. There's a number of ways that you could word that type of thing where the athlete, depending on what their background and sort of education is, um, they can start to know what that should feel like. Zone five, this is going to be more about performance language at this point. So it'll be like max effort four time as many rounds as possible. Um, and you're saying that it's a test, right? So that should be again, sort of executed at, at max effort or very hard effort. Um, all those sorts of things. Okay. So let's get into these six principles of heart rate training. First use individualized max heart rate. Two, use heart rate as a governor for intensity. Three, use heart rate primarily in cyclical settings. Four, use heart rate for sustained efforts. Five, use climbing caps for underdeveloped athletes. And six, use different zones for different modalities. So let's go over these one by one. First is to use an individualized max heart rate. For each of these, I'm also going to give sort of the contrast of that, uh, like the most common mistake that I see from uh, that type of principle. And the mistake here is that not so much that people don't use max heart rate because you have to use max heart rate to determine your zones. However, more so that they use either a device to, to find that where the device isn't really capable of finding that accurately, or they use a calculator and they don't pick the right calculator to do that. So. Ideally, probably someone would not use a calculator. How are, however, there are calculators that are better than others. For example, like 220 minus someone's age is probably the most popular uh, calculator out there. And that can get you into the ballpark, but generally <laughs> it's, it's going to be quite inaccurate, especially for people who are often highly trained where that will actually impact their, their max heart rate. And sometimes people are just individual outliers where based on their genetics, they can get their heart rate significantly higher than their quote unquote, like supposed to, uh, for someone, uh, their age. And I've, I've several athletes who are like that, who I can actually point to as examples and be like, Hey, you're a master's athlete, you know, you're well into your forties. And you know, I, I've more than one athlete who's this way, who you look at their training and there are several times in maybe the course of, you know, maybe not a week, but like maybe two week period where they're getting their heart rate up and above 200 in their training. And that's something that's like, man, they should not be able to do that according to a lot of those type of calculators. Um, so it definitely is individualized and it's something that you can get close with calculators, but you might not get all the way. So what I do for the people that I coach, if they don't have a way to get max heart rate, we can start as sort of like a baseline using some of these calculations 
that are something other than 220 minus age, right? Stuff that is going to be a little bit more accurate uh, based on scientific studies. So for example, white 2008, that's the study, um, was 0.55 times someone's age subtracted from 202, right? Another one would be Jackson from 2005, uh, 0.67 times someone's age subtracted from 206.9. Miller, 93, uh, 0.85 times someone's age subtracted from 217. I have a couple other ones here. So then I plug this person's age into the spreadsheet. It averages all of those different studies to get one final prediction for someone's max heart rate. That's probably the most accurate that we can do without actually getting a measurement. So if you want access to that max heart rate calculator, I'm going to open it up where people can uh, copy the, the spreadsheet and then use it for themselves. Again, I'll link to that in the show notes, zorfitness.com slash podcast slash 098. The other mistake would just be using uh, a device that's really not going to be very accurate to measure someone's max heart rate. Devices that are on the wrist that don't include a chest strap are not good options for this. Um, things like an Apple Watch or a Whoop without a chest strap or a Garmin that's just a watch and not a chest strap are not very accurate because all they're doing is just having light where the amount of light that is absorbed determines whether there's more or less blood moving through that tissue, which can help determine whether the, the heart's in a systolic or diastolic uh, phase of contraction, basically be able to measure someone's beats per minute of their heart. However, there can be inaccuracies with that, especially in things that involve gripping, like rowing, like pull-ups or kettlebell swings or anything that we see a lot in CrossFit. Uh, or if someone has, again, sort of a, an outlier uh, heart rate where they're getting it up really close to their max, sometimes, especially if they've entered their, their age and things like that into the device, it'll cap them at a certain amount and push them back down to a lower threshold, sort of like rework the equation, the algorithm of how it's actually determining that. And often that leads to people reading average heart rates that are very, very close to their max. Uh, so for example, I've been in workouts before with my Garmin's pretty good. It's got a chest strap, but, uh, some other brands that I won't mention that it was like, I'll be cruising at like in the low one seventies and a pretty tough piece on like a, like an air bike. And all of a sudden I'll like drop down to like one fifteen. And it'll just be like hanging out there for a couple seconds and then it'll jump back up to like 168. <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, clearly something's amiss there. So if it's not a chest strap, it could be a little bit inaccurate. So I'll link to a, a monitor that I like. I like Polar. I also have a Garmin, but that's a little bit more expensive. If you're just looking for heart rate functionality and a pretty minimalistic uh, like watch, uh, the Polar is great. And then it also connects to, for me and my assault bike. And I believe my Echo, the Echo bikes of the gym are connected to as well. Um, so it's a good option if you're looking to have that capability as well. And even if you have a really good, accurate heart rate monitor, you still have to be able to get your physiology to express your max heart rate uh, to be able to determine what that actually is. So here's a little test that I did up and I will occasionally put athletes through this if they have, really don't have a clue what their max heart rate is or they, they don't have an accurate guess. First thing you need to do is a 10 minute test on an air bike. Uh, ideally it would be an air bike. You could also just do like a 10 minute you know, run time trial or something like that, and then try to mimic similar paces off something like that. Ideally, it would be like a, an air bike uh, where you're involving basically arms and legs just to get the most musculature possible involved. So here's the test from zero to five minutes, you're at 50% of your 10 minute test average wattage from five to eight, 60% from eight to nine minutes, 70% from nine to 10 minutes, you're going to take like a, a walk break. Um, and that's actually when the test is going to start. So basically there's like a ramp up period and then the test will start. I will link to this protocol in the show notes. At the 10 minute mark, you're actually going to start the ramp up. So the test itself is a ramping uh, test where you're trying to progressively go faster and faster, harder and harder. And the heart rate is going to, whilst lag slightly behind, it will mirror that or correlate very closely to that. So every 30 seconds, you're going to build your pace by a certain number of watts until you fail right? It's a, it's a test to failure. So, and for both of the, the people here, whether you're below 300 uh, watts as your average 10 minute test pace or above, uh, both of them are going to start at hundred watts. So if your 10 minute test average pace or average, sorry, wattage is above 300, you're going to climb by increments of 50 watts. If it's below 300, you're going to climb by increments of 25 watts. And that's just rough to kind of have people climbing about the same rate to get them Extend it into a time domain that allows them to actually get their heart rate up to the highest point possible when they fail, 
rather than failing due to muscular fatigue or failing just because they have a lot of blood in their legs or something other than their systemic work rate being the limiter. So a test like that is going to get someone very close to their max heart rate. Uh, so that's the first thing that someone could do is find what their max heart rate is and try to get the most accurate picture of that as they possibly could. Our next principle is to then use heart rate as a governor for intensity. And this is something that I've held to really uh, pretty strictly for myself over the last probably two plus years. And it's something that I think more people should implement, um, especially people who are training CrossFit athletes. Uh, but I think this is probably a good recommendation sort of across the board, almost regardless of what uh, activity someone's training for. So if we think about what a governor is, we think about something like a golf cart. <laughs> uh, like a governor basically sets a, a cap of speed, right? So it won't allow you to go faster than a certain speed, although you could, like the machine has the capability, or in this case, your body has the capability for more gears above that. It just sets that threshold of, okay, at this point, we're gonna stop it or cap it. We're not gonna go any faster or harder than that. Um, it's exactly the same thing what's happening with uh, someone's physiology when you put like a heart rate or zone cap on them. So for example, like a 20 minute bike at zone two average, it basically saying that the athlete isn't allowed to go any faster than this, right? Oftentimes I'll write things as like a nasal cap, which has nothing to do with heart rate because that'll change quite a bit, but it's saying like, Hey, you can go as fast as you want, provided that you keep this governor in place, right? And provided in this case that it's a nasal cap, or in this case that it's a zone two heart rate cap. The thing I see here the most as a mistake is writing sustained high zone work. So for example, like 20 minute run at zone five, right? If you could actually do it, which would be extremely challenging if you did to sustain over 90% of your max heart rate for that full 20 minutes, it would be just the wrong thing to focus on, frankly. Like at that point, you are writing performance training. Like you want that athlete to essentially go as fast as they can that entire time, then let them focus on going as fast as they possibly can. So rather than writing it as a way of like heart rate, write it as performance training, write it as, you know, a 20 minute run time trial. Like that would be way better and result in the same thing, but with a different intention for that athlete. It allows them to basically focus on their performance and things within their control that can help improve their performance rather than just focusing on trying to drive their heart rate up as high as they can, which has no point into it for training. So what would actually contribute to an athlete's performance? Things other than heart rate, that's something actually worthwhile to focus on. Things like effort, technique, you know, the power output or like paces. Like if you're rowing on a machine, you can see, okay, I'm at a, a 151 pace. Okay, I'm at a 153 pace. You know kind of how that should feel and what your average paces are you can start to make that more performance oriented. Uh, it could be like your split places for running. Uh, certainly we can focus on things like breathing, right? All these have a direct positive impact on someone's performance in a way that trying to drive up heart rate doesn't, right? Generally, I want people focusing on trying to make a certain speed or certain work rate as easy as possible as sustainable as possible and as repeatable as possible, rather than trying to make that as challenging as possible, like trying to like drive up your heart rate and get basically try to make the same amount of work less sustainable just for the sake of driving up your heart rate. Like that's the wrong thing to focus on. Principle number three would be to use heart rate primarily in cyclical settings. So for example, like a 25 minute uh, row at zone two, we could say five rounds at a zone three average heart rate, two minutes on the rower, two minutes on the air bike. Simple things like that, again, entirely cyclical, even if it's involving more than one modality, it's cyclical. The mistake here would be using heart rate to try to determine CrossFit mixed work. So basically doing Metcons and using heart rate as a determining factor within that. Generally, I think that's really hard to predict, especially in higher output, more acyclical in like the true sense of it, uh, settings where things are less sustainable and they have some sort of bottleneck other than just systemic work rate. So like individual quarterfinals 2023 for CrossFit, like possibly all five of those events weren't limited by heart rate. You could probably make that argument for the higher level athletes that that was not the case. So it would be foolish to use heart rate based training on something like that, right? You need to make it more about the performance, somehow figure out how to dictate and progress uh, CrossFit training that is not based on heart rate. And generally, I would say that if you're having CrossFit style events where they're having stronger contractions, 
where it dictates more rest, like needs more rest in between each of those contractions, that heart rate is progressively going to be less, like less useful, less of a, like a good tool for that uh, job. Like it just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, so the more sustainable and repeatable contractions are, and the more light repeatable contractions that there are, probably makes more sense to do heart rate. So it probably makes more sense to use heart rate on something like Murph, where you're doing Cindy rounds and some running and, you know, like these lightly weighted, um, pull-ups, push-ups and air squats, right. To, to have that sort of environment makes a whole lot more sense than if you're doing, uh, you know, intervals of burby box jump overs and power cleans at a really heavy load. Like that just doesn't make sense to wear a heart rate monitor for something like that. In those settings where they have that higher power output and you are in cross set mix work, I think it makes more sense to use tools like EMOMs, intervals, uh, dictating work rest ratios, using things like perceived effort to dictate how someone's actually executing their training. And those aren't all mutually exclusive, by the way. You could have intervals that, uh, you know, have like a one to one work rest ratio and are supposed to be executed at 85% effort. You could have all of those in kind of tied into one. So you could use multiple of those, you know, training ideas. The fourth principle is to use heart rate for sustained efforts. The mistake would be to use heart rates or a zone cap with zero ramp up period. This will be easiest if I just like give you an example and, and explain it that way. So here's an example that would probably be a negative example, a bad example of what maybe you would not want to do for an athlete. 30 minute external clock row at your 5k time trial split pace until your heart rate enters zone four, rest 60 seconds, which in first glance, that seems like a good idea and good training. And I've written plenty of this type of training for athletes. However, generally, unless you're trying to have these really descending sets, in terms of time that they're actually working, that's not the best way that you could uh, write that work. So for example, if this was me doing this training, because this could very easily, I haven't done this, but it could, I've done plenty of things like this. Say I actually do this piece. My average uh, 5K time trial pace is 151 per 500 meters. So guessing about how long I could hold each one of those, like say this would be be what it was. It would be like a, you know, maybe seven minutes on that very first one until I actually get up into zone four. It's going to take a while to get there. Um, rest one minute, come back and I do three and a half minutes. Come back again, 215, 150, 147, 144, 139, 141, 137, right? We could probably continue on something like that. So basically all the work is front loaded. That first interval or two, you're probably going to get almost half the volume in something that's like at that 30 minute duration of that entire rest of the piece. So you're doing all this front loaded work, which makes the work, like if you do work that way, it becomes a very expensive. It's way more of a, it's a, it's a strong training impact. However, you're going to be like hyperventilating that entire time working really hard. Your heart rate's going to be uh, up, but also like just kind of like, it was like pedal of the metal from the very beginning where you're just kind of slowly increasing, holding that. And it's, it's in generally not the, in general, not the best way to accumulate the most high quality work in a less costly manner, uh, which is generally the goal of training. And this all comes down to a concept called cardiac lag. Basically your heart is reactive to what the rest of your body and work rate is doing. So it's going to take some time for your heart rate to get up to the point that matches your work rate. Typically, those two things aren't uh, aligned perfectly. So for example, you'll start off on your time trial and your heart rate might be at like 90 beats per minute when you start off that time trial. It's going to very quickly ramp up, but that might actually take 60, 90 seconds, two minutes until it matches what your work rate is. Where your work rate, your power output immediately jumped up and held to a steady pace, your heart rate's gonna lag behind that. So that's where that concept cardiac lag comes in. So if you understand that that happens, that's where you can start to be a little bit more uh, just intelligent in how you actually write that training for your athlete. So if we get the exact same sort of workout, 30 minute external clock, row 5K time trial split pace until zone four, rest 60 seconds, really the only thing that you could do to change that, maybe not the only thing you could do, but maybe this would be a good way that you could change it. You just put a little asterisk or like a note and say, uh, the first three intervals have a cap of three minutes. 
So in other words, you, you take that 60 second break, whether you're at zone four or not for those first three intervals. And after that, you just ignore that and keep going, going. And likely that's going to result in having shorter intervals, obviously the cap to three minutes at the beginning, but longer intervals towards the end where that work is distributed across the entire time, a little bit more evenly and not all of it's front loaded at the very, very beginning. And then the quality typically will diminish towards the, the second half uh, and kind of destroy the work rest ratio that kind of helps maintain the, the often desired stimulus of that piece a little bit better. The other thing you could do if it was just like a straight uh, zone piece, for example, like a 20 minute zone three row, you could say, take three to five minutes to climb into zone three. And then the clock that of that 20 minute row actually starts once you are in zone three. So you have to wait until you're in zone three, then the clock starts, but take several minutes to get up to that point and allow yourself to ramp up and don't just go straight into it too hard. You want to take some time to build up to that heart rate zone. Principle number five would be to use climbing caps for underdeveloped athletes. This sounds <laughs> offensive. Um, I don't mean it that way, right? It's just saying like, a person who relative to other energy systems has an underdeveloped aerobic system. So this could just be someone who's a little bit more powerful, um, biased in that direction. So not necessarily underdeveloped as an athlete, just having a less developed or less robust uh, aerobic system in particular. So again, the mistake that I would say here is writing a single like moderate zone for a very extended uh, effort without you know changing that zone at all just having it in one zone like you know 60 minutes in zone two average uh, for a less developed athlete is going to be a real issue basically because their power is going to drop throughout that in order to maintain that that zone two heart rate so they're going to start off say it's a 60 minute assault bike at a zone two average heart rate they're going to start off and they're going to be at you know 275 watts if it's a, a male athlete for example and by the 30 minute mark, maybe they're down at 215, but by the, the 55 minute work mark, they're at 175 watts. Like it's just going to keep falling because the heart rate is going to continue to climb. And this goes back to a, another probably important concept of a heart rate training, which again, I feel like a lot of people maybe intuitively understand, but really haven't put like a, a real solid, uh, picture, like mental concept of, and that's called cardiac drift. Cardiac drift basically says that the longer you go at the same pace, the higher your heart rate is going to continue to climb. And this could be to, due to a number of factors, right? A, like critical power, critical torque is going to slowly fall the longer someone continues to work at a, a, at a certain you know, given work rate. And then also things like dehydration can play a role. Things like uh, having increased thermoregulation demand. So in other words, someone's like has a lot of metabolic heat that they got to blow off. Basically, you have to dilate more blood vessels in your periphery, get blood flowing out that way. That's going to have a impact on your heart rate because obviously you're now, you know, vasodilating more blood vessels. Your heart's got to work higher, harder to pump blood to all of those blood vessels. Blood pressure is going to be impacted. Cardiac output is going to be impacted. And as a result, heart rate is going to be impacted as well. And in general, as I said, it's going to slowly creep up on you the longer you go. There's not really exceptions to that, but there are people who will delay that cardiac drift. Um, if you're working out in a cooler environment where the thermal regulation, regulation isn't as much of an issue, if you're someone who has a greatly developed aerobic system and you're just really biased that way and have a lot of training history there, that's also going to offset that, right? Basically, you have better endurance uh, that will that will certainly impact it. So, But again, if we have someone who is a little bit underdeveloped or they're a little bit more novice um, as it comes to this uh, type of training, this is something that you could do. Like, here's an example. Instead of that 60 minute bike, just at like a zone two average, you could start off and have 60 minute air brake, but underneath kind of have some asterisks, uh, some notes from zero to 10 minutes. Maybe it's at zone one from 10 to 30 at zone two from 30 to 55 minutes at zone three. And then the last five minutes, 55 to 60 is at a recovery or flush pace. Right. And that way it's sort of like a build and warm up, slowly allowing that athlete to climb another heart rate zone. Uh, and hopefully just maintaining their wattage and you can even write that in there as well and then having a, a sort of built-in recovery period where they're not having their heart rate continue to climb and efforts stay high all the way until they get off the bike uh, that's a good way to do it and our sixth and final principle here is use different zones for different modalities i think the biggest thing here is that people don't understand that different modalities are going to change heart rate and stroke volume significantly 
So stroke volume simply being the amount of blood that comes out of your heart per beat, which obviously you want to drive that up because it's supplying your entire body with more blood. The other way that you can get more blood to your entire body is just by increasing heart rate, which has a, a ceiling to it. Right? You can only drive up your heart rate so much. So that's why you want to improve your stroke volume. Those multiplied by each other, the amount per beat times the amount of times it's beating is what cardiac output is. So the amount that your heart is putting out per minute uh, of work. So cardiac output and especially stroke volume is going to be uh, impacted on different training modalities. So think about like if you're on the rower versus an air bike versus running uh, versus swimming versus a skier, each of those is going to have a slightly different uh, max heart rate that's associated with it and also will be as a result impact uh, someone's stroke volume. So for example, if your body orientation is vertical, you're probably going to have a slightly lower stroke uh, volume than if something is still high effort, but it can be a, a horizontal uh, body orientation. So for example, like swimming often allows people to have a slightly higher stroke volume because you're not having to work against gravity to get blood back to the heart uh, because you're literally like laid over. Likewise, the more muscle groups that are involved, the higher that's often going to drive your heart rate just because you have more total musculature working higher total metabolic work. So things like running are probably going to be historically the highest heart rates. Things that involve less muscle groups like ski erg, swimming, things that are maybe just more upper body dominated are often going to have a lower max heart rate associated with them. So that's one more thing that people just need to consider is that, again, you might see a drop off of like, okay, this is your max heart rate. For me, it might be like 189. And then for like running, it probably is like 189 if I'm truly recovered and able to express that. And then for like air bike, it might be like that or like maybe minus one beat per minute for my max. Then rowing, it might be like two off that max. For something like ski arc, it might be like three. For something like swimming, it might be like four or five beats lower than that yet. So, and that's not a science, right? If someone's really uncomfortable in the water, they're not even going to be able to get their heart rate anywhere close to that because they're going to feel like they're suffocating. So it really depends on someone's proficiency in each of those, but if someone's highly developed in each of those, that might be a, a relatively reasonable drop off that you could expect in someone's max heart rate. So we just need to understand that something like zone three on like an air bike or zone three running does not equal zone three on a skier. Zone three on a skier could be truly max effort and the person just doesn't, um, you know, have the, the enough muscle groups involved to be able to raise that heart rate anymore. So one more time, the six principles, here they are. One, use individualized max heart rate. Two, use heart rate as a governor for intensity. Three, use heart rate primarily in cyclical settings. Four, use heart rate for sustained efforts. Five, use climbing caps for underdeveloped athletes. Six, use different zones for different modalities. Thanks for listening today, and I hope you learned something new about heart rate training. Thanks for listening today. If you're someone who just found the show, I would encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date. If you're someone who's been listening for a while and enjoying what you're hearing, I would encourage you to leave a rating or review for the show. It would definitely help us out. And lastly, if you're someone who does take your fitness seriously and cares about your performance deeply, I would encourage you to look into hiring one of our coaches. Until next time, stay the course.